Okay, so now we're going to get into inserting and modifying steel shapes. And we'll start with one of the most common ones, the wide flange beam. So we just click the icon here and it brings up this dialog box. And this dialog box is everything we need to insert this shape. And I'm just going to go down these items here and uh, describe each one of them, starting with the type. So the type is essentially a list of all the different types of shapes that correlate with the icons over here. Everything in this list is what you see um, in the toolbar over here. The reason it's here is if you need to make changes after the fact, after you maybe you uh, selected the wrong icon, or maybe you're modifying a member and you want to change its type, you select that here. Inside that is the data file, which is like the subtype. So within wide flange, within the wide flange type, you have things like the American standard beams, and you've got the miscellaneous beams and the pilings, and then the wide flanges. And the other the other uh, types, steel types, are the same way. They've got their own subsets. So uh, once we've selected wide flange, here's where you're going to have all the member sizes in this window on the left. Um, and you can scroll through and find almost every member size, but it's important to note that not every member size that's in the steel book is going to be listed here. Um, I can't tell you which ones aren't here. It, just be aware that there may be some odd sizes that uh, an engineer specifies that you can't find in here. Um, a good example of that that I just recently worked with was a 21 by 55. If you notice here, starting with 2144, there is no 2155. It just doesn't exist um, in this selection anywhere towards 2455, but there's no 2155. But that member size is in the steel book, just not available to me in CAD work. So something to keep in mind. Um, in addition to um, just selecting a member, you can double click a member, which is the same as clicking properties. When you double click it, it brings up information about that particular member, um, such as all the uh, all the dimensions and your engineering dimensions and things of that nature. Even the gauge is listed at the bottom. Um, the it because this dat the database for uh, this version of CAD works is a little outdated. Some of the stuff might have changed. Um, so, like specifically, if you look at the gauge of uh, 824, you scroll out the bottom and it says G for for the gauge. It says it's three and a half inches. Uh, currently, in the most current edition of the Steelbook, it's at four inches. So, some some things may or may not have changed. Um, I know that the I believe the K1 distance for 1490 and up. Uh, has changed, uh, possibly with the K and the K1, but I believe the K1 is a lot larger now. So don't don't use this as your guide. It's just it's there for a quick reference, but not as your absolute guide. Speaking of which, um, you'll notice that the depth doesn't say 14 inches exactly, even though a uh, 14 by 90 is 14 inches. They use this. Uh, there, there's two different dimensions. Uh, listed in the steel book and one of them is like a nominal dimension like an architectural imperial unit the other one's a decimal dimension it's the decimal dimension that's being used by CAD works to determine the size of the member this is important because if you go and measure out a member from top to bottom flange to flange in CAD works you'll notice that it matches it, it you know especially if you have your precision turned up it matches this decimal dimension it's not exactly uh, the not the nominal dimension that the that you're thinking of so it's not like this for every member. Um, you know, some members like the W831 uh, are exactly eight inches. You know, um, they're exactly what they say they are nominally. So just something to keep in mind if it doesn't add up right. Okay, to exit. Moving on, uh, we have the rotation angle for the member. So the rotation angle is exactly what it sounds like. You're setting the angle for the 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 cross section. That's the, you know, picking an axis. It's not actually, and I'll get to, to rotation axis in a bit, but it's uh, it's rotating around the, an axis perpendicular to the cross section. So just looking at this, and imagine this rotating, that's a rotation angle. Uh, rotation angle has to be set through the dialog box. You cannot do, or you're not supposed to, uh, do a manual rotation of a, of a shape um, in the model. And I'll, I'll sh give an example of why you're not supposed to do that. Moving on to insertion location. The insertion location of the member is much like a block insertion location. 
It's just showing where the shape is going to be inserted. It picks an imaginary point that's invisible to you, and that becomes the uh, insertion point of that member. And I'll, I'll show that in a second. It'll be, become more clear on how that works. The center line location is where the center line is located in, ref, in, uh, in respects to the shape, the cross section of the shape. There's three locations, the top, the center, and the bottom. So it'll put it here, here, or here. Keep in mind the insertion location is not the same as the center line location. Okay. So I'll, it will make a lot of sense in a second. Moving down here to these uh, data boxes. These you really don't want to have to do anything with. The only thing you might modify is the description line. You definitely don't want to mess with your short and long annotation because uh, this is where your single line steel is going to read from when it reads your long and short annotation. And we'll, when we get into single line, you'll see that this is what it's reading from. So don't don't change these. The description line is the one line you're you're likely to make modifications to. This is a, a good it's a good area if you need to tag steel, for example. Let's say you're working with some uh, miscellaneous pipe supports or tray supports, which commonly have numbers attached to them. Um, they have like a an, an MPS tag of some sort. Um, you can you can put that MPS number here in the description line, replace what's what's there with uh, your your support number, and then what happens is when uh, you place the steel in the tooltip when you hover over it or in Navisworks in your tooltips, as long as this description line is set up to be shown in the tooltip, you'll be able to see what uh, whatever that steel has been tagged with. So then I'll I'll show, I'll show an example of that later on as well, and that's. Uh, everything as far as specifying how your member is supposed to look or be inserted or what you're trying to put in. Now let's actually insert the member. There's two ways to insert the member. You can either pick two points or you can select a line. Since I don't have a line drawn yet, we're going to go ahead and pick two points. So I'm just going to click pick points and pick two points. And there's my member. And mousing over it shows me that I've got, you know, the member size is an 8 by 31. The other method is to draw a line and then go back to insert the beam and say select lines and it's not plural because you can select multiple lines but I just have the one I'm gonna select this line and it draws the shape as the same length as the line and at the same insertion this is important because if I erase this and I change this from a top insertion to a center insertion it's gonna put the beam at this at, at the uh, where the line is, but because the insertion is at the center, it's centered on the beam. So this is this is that important distinction. Notice how the center line is not there. That's just where the insertion was. If I double click this beam, you can see the insertion is set to the middle. I'll change it to the top and then I'll move down. So as an aid, I'm going to draw a circle on the left side of this. And we're going to change the insertion point. And you'll see the beam dance around and wherever I set the insertion point, that's always going to match up where that circle is. So if I go to the bottom left here, you're going to see this bottom left corner move up to that circle. And the center line moves with it. If I go to the bottom center, it moves to the center. If I go to the, the, top, the top center, it moves down to the top center. So what we're doing is we're changing the insertion point of this beam, and the center line goes with it. So I'll go to the center, right? And now it's centered. And now I can independently change the location of the center line by coming in here and choosing top, center, or bottom. So I'll go to center. I think that didn't change. Center or bottom. Just as, as an aside, you'll notice that I'm what I'm doing here is I'm double-clicking to edit these members. There's no command needed. You just double-click a member to edit it. And it will bring up the component edit dialog box. You can also select a member and just click off to the, double click off to the side and you can do the same thing edit it you can also have multiple members selected and you'll notice here it says component one of two what it's going to do is cycle through um, windows to edit each member so there's the first member and there's a the second member if I have a lot of these members and I, and I have them all selected and I double click it's going to want to go through every one of these members so keep that in mind if you have a large range of members selected when you double click um, it's going to want to go through every one of them is counting upward until it gets to the last one and then we're done so try not to have so many members selected just click the one member if you want to edit it okay so let's get into rotation I'm going to reset this beam by double clicking it and changing the insertion to the top and changing the center line location to the top and hitting okay 
Now, on the topic of rotation, I'm going to reset my UCS here. On the topic of rotation, it seems like your rotation axis is based on these insertion points. That seems like the logical thing, um, the intuitive thing, but that's not actually how the rotation works. The rotation axis is always your center line, not your insertion point. Okay, so I'm going to set the insertion point to the center and leave my center line location to the top so that they don't match. That way there's no confusion here. When I rotate, I'm going to rotate this 90 degrees. Okay, actually at 180, I want to flip it 180 degrees. Logically, you think it should just rotate around the axis of the insertion point. It's not. It's going to rotate around the axis of the center line. If this thing were to rotate around the center, it would just look exactly the same because you're spinning it in place. But what's going to happen is the bottom flange is going to flip all the way up to the top by hitting OK. See how that works? Because we're rotating around this. It's essentially, I'm going to turn my ortho off here. I'm going to rotate this like doing this. This is the rotation axis. I'm going to undo a few times. Okay. Let's do that again. This is the rotation axis, not this. In order for this to become the rotation axis, we have to set the center line location to the center. Now, when I change it to 180, it's going to look exactly the same because it's just rotating in place. It's and it's symmetrical right in the center. Or I can go 90 degrees and you can see it just flips around that axis. It's flipping around the center line. This isn't as important for beams, but very important when it comes to columns. Let's go ahead and put a column in instead. I want to show you that when you pick points and you attempt to put a column in, you are not allowed to do so. Actually, let me reset my UCS and try this again. So usually, a lot of times you'll be working in your world UCS. So I'm going to pick points, right? And I'm going to say uh, I, I want the, uh, the, the insertion point to be at the center of the column. And I want my center line to be at the center line of the column because with columns, most things you want to happen at the center. Your beams connect to the center, your braces connect to the center. When it comes to column lines, it's always at the center of the beam. Most of the time, you're going to want to work with the center of the beam, not the edge of the beam, or a column, I'm sorry, at the edge of the, you're, you're going to want to work with the center of the column, not the edge of the column. So we're going to choose center and center, and then we're going to pick points. You'll notice that with my ortho on, it only lets me place uh, a beam. I can only put things in the X and Y axis. I cannot put them in the beam axis. I'm sorry, the Z and the Z axis, like you would expect. Like when you draw a line, AutoCAD allows you to put a line on the Z axis. So because of this, whenever you want to draw a column, you place a line first, then go to your um, your shape insertion tool and choose select lines or pick points. You, you can choose select lines and it will insert it that way. Or it takes a little longer this way. I don't think it's as, as, as easy, but you can choose pick points and then pick those two points and it will do the exact same thing. So, but probably just uh, select the line. Again, you have to have a line drawn vertically before you can place the member vertically because CADWorks tries to lock it to that X and Y axis. Okay, so again, speaking in terms of rotation, why can you not rotate it manually? Why do you have to use the rotation uh, parameter inside the dialog box because it embeds the rotation angle with the member. If you try to uh, if you try to rotate this member manually, okay, let's say I rotate this 90 degrees. You'll notice now that my uh, web is parallel with my y-axis. It's running north-south. Okay. Let's say I go to stretch this member. You can stretch members by just uh, grabbing the grip at the end and just stretching the center line, you'll notice now my web is no longer going north-south, it's now going east-west. And the reason for that is because the, the rotation value was saved with the member. It's always going to be zero. Doesn't matter if I rotate this 45 degrees. Oops, let's rotate that again. If I stretch this, and again, you can use if you can use a strep grit, stretch grip or you can use a stretch command on the end of the member. Watch what's going to happen. It's going to pop back into that east-west orientation. And there it is. In order for this to be rotated and save the rotation, you need to set that rotation parameter or value here. And now it will be saved. This is really important when it comes to drawing on sites that uh, are modeled at true north rather than plant north. 
I'm sure we've all worked with those kind of uh, those kind of sites um, where your structures have to be drawn at angles um, that are not you know north south east west 90 degree angles or even you know easy 45 degree angles there are some crazy angle that you have to use um you you have to even if it's at a weird angle that's to the third decimal place you're going to have to give it your best shot and get as close as you can with putting that angle right here um that's the only way that angle is going to stick and what sucks is that this actually translates to angles itself like uh angle steel which have their own rotations, and I'll get to angle still in a bit, but it makes it gets a bit more complicated. So just keep that in mind that you need to make sure that rotation parameter is set. Okay, I think that takes care of everything as far as these members go. The rest of the the rest of these shapes are going to be very very similar as far as the the layout of the insertion tool goes. Not a lot is going to be different. Uh, you're going to choose the type, the data file, the size, your insertion point, your rotation, and your centerline location, all that jazz. It's all the same stuff. So um, we'll get into the rest of the shapes um, next and kind of go through all that.